So Connected North class, I'd like at home, I'd like to introduce you to our really great Connected North friend. Her name is Rebecca and she works at the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum and she does lots of sessions with us in the fall. She does something called Halloween Slime and Slime and if you want, we can do Slime, but we're not sure if the parents are gonna like that. Parents, let us know if that's something we could maybe do in June, which would be a fun June activity. Um, and she does sessions on wind and also um, how um, animals adapt in the winter time. And oh, fractions. She's, yep, she's a fraction hero. So lots of really fun sessions with students. Um, so sort of sadly, some of them require materials. When we do sessions with Rebecca, we get a great big package of stuff, but right now we're going to work with what we have, which we always do. We're going to use our innovation and imagination and work through this. And at the end, I'm going to show you where you can find how to make your own wind turbine and wind and and windmill that Rebecca sent. So that works to seven families now, Mally. I know seven families. There we go. See, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Molly and Katie. So yeah, as uh, Molly just said, my name's Rebecca. I work for the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I am stuck at home though, because yes, we are also locked down here. Um, so I'm, I've been able to present things from my home. I've had to adapt and modify things a little bit, but it's been pretty fun. But today, we're going to talk about wind energy and I love it because back when I was a kid, things like renewable energy sources, which is what wind energy is, it's an example of a renewable energy source. They, it wasn't popular and it's getting more and more popular as more and more people demand renewable uh, energy sources like wind, like sun, like water as well. And so I have a little slideshow I'm going to share with you guys, just because I like to have some visuals that I can see um, when I'm learning. So I like to share my presentation with you guys. So I'm going to start from the beginning. If you, you may have seen pictures of windmills before, or maybe you've seen a wind turbine, just like this, at least this is what they look like in my home state. Um, I know, I think the number is in Michigan, in one area in particular, there's 758 of these wind turbines just in one little area, it's the thumb area. Um, so it's pretty cool. So again, becoming more and more popular. So let's first talk about, before we get into what a wind turbine is, let's talk about what a non-renewable energy source is. So, You've probably heard of these terms before. Um, renewable energy source just means that you can't use it up. You'll always have lots of it. So for instance, wind, sun, and water. You can't ever run out of those things. So no matter how many times we use it, it'll always be a source for us for energy as long as we can harness it. And they're typically known as clean energy sources also known as green energy, you might have heard them called. And then I like to compare them to non-renewable energy sources. So non-renewable energy sources are sources that once they're gone, they're gone forever. So a good example of that is coal, oil. It takes thousands and millions of years for coal and oil to be created because it came from dinosaur fossils, dinosaur bones. Um, and yeah, once we're out of it, we're out of it. And also to get the energy from those types of uh, fossil fuels, we have to burn it and that creates a lot of pollution. And so that's why they're known as, you probably heard of this term before, dirty energy sources. So it's not clean energy, like a renewable energy source. It's dirty because to get that energy in a form that we can use it, we gotta burn it. And that creates lots of pollution and lots of waste. So um, 
I, I know there's some little ones, maybe not so little. When I've been doing this program, there's been like babies attending some of these programs. So when I bring out the first law of thermodynamics, I have to say, it's a very sophisticated term alert. Some of you might have heard it, especially if you're in seventh grade, you've probably heard of this. But biggest thing to keep in mind um, when it comes to energy is that it cannot be created or destroyed. And that's known as the first law of thermodynamics. So again, very sophisticated. I would just be like, whoa, I can't understand that. But all you need to know for that is that it cannot be created or destroyed. Energy can only be transferred from one form to another. So for instance, I like to give the example, you see the food here on my screen, and then you see, oops, <laughs> I just wanna make sure I'm still, one second. Oopsie, oopsie, sorry. Technical difficulties from current slide. So I like to use the example of our food that we eat. So I eat a banana uh, and that energy that from that banana is stored in my body. And then I can actually transform it into something called mechanical energy. For instance, if I wanted to go on a bike ride and there was a really tall, steep hill, that energy that from that banana would be converted to mechanical energy so I could do work to go up that hill. And same with sun energy. Again, it's a type of heat energy. There's something called photons that get released when sunlight is shining. And those photons are picked up by solar panels. But again, when solar panels collect the energy of the sun, they're not sending sun energy into our rooms. Like for instance, I'm turning on and off my light. That's not sun energy, that's electrical energy. But if there was a solar panel outside of my house, that energy was transformed from the sun energy to electrical energy. A lot of different processes go into play there, but the biggest thing is energy cannot be created or destroyed. We have all the energy we ever need or uh, have had on planet Earth and it's only transformed from one form to another. So again, don't be scared by that first law of thermodynamics because it's actually pretty simple. <laughs> and so for a wind turbine, there are four types of energy that we're gonna talk about in terms of a wind turbine. So what I like to talk about is potential energy. I like to give the example of a roller coaster. If you love roller coasters, that's great. They scare me. I like to look at them though, but they are very nerve wracking. But if you're on the top of a roller coaster, and that's why I put a picture, you see the car at the very top. So potential energy is basically stored energy. So when you're at the top of the roller coaster, all that energy is stored. And then as soon big hill, it transforms into kinetic energy or the energy of motion. So potential energy, again, stored energy. You're like, for instance, if you're resting, you have potential energy in you. You're not doing any work. Maybe you're just taking a nap. But as soon as you jump up to answer the door or answer the phone, your potential energy is transforming to kinetic energy, that energy of motion. And then another part of it, mechanical energy. So this is a big part with wind turbines because there's a lot of mechanical machine-like things in a wind turbine, but with mechanical energy, it can be both kinetic, so the energy of movement, and it can be potential energy, the stored energy. So machines and us humans use this type of energy to do work. So I always thought, Mechanical energy, I'm not a machine, but we actually use mechanical energy. Like I said, that example earlier when I'm eating food and that energy from the food is transformed into mechanical energy so I can ride my bike up a hill, that's all mechanical energy is. It can be both kinetic and potential. And then a big part of wind turbines is electrical energy. It's just like I gave that example 
of the sun. We don't plug in the sun to our walls to power our homes. We actually have to have electrical energy for that. And so wind energy is transformed, is collected through those wind turbines or those big blades, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. And then there's a lot of different mechanisms inside and a generator, I'll go through in a minute, which transforms it to electrical energy, which is a form of energy we need to power our homes, our businesses, our schools. So those are four types of energy that are the most important when it comes to wind turbines. And electrical energy be probably the most of the most important for it, our wind turbines. Okay, so, <laughs> excuse me, if you've never seen a wind turbine, that's okay, but I feel like Canada's pretty progressive in that you guys, you guys have embraced clean energy, which is really great. And again, Michigan has quite a few too, but I'd like to see a lot more. Um, but there are many- Rebecca, sorry, it's Katie. Just so you know, a lot of the Nunavut communities, because it's so windy uh -huh. up there, they leverage wind energy or they're just starting to, and we're seeing really nice uh, wind energy happening in very far north places. Good, see? Yeah, I think I was with a Nunavut class when everything was normal um, and the teacher was saying, or maybe one of you is saying that they had just built a, um, a wind turbine connected to their greenhouse, which was helping power their school, which again, very cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, Good job, Canada. Good job, Nunavut. Um, it's really impressive because, again, when I was a kid, wind energy, not popular at all because it was expensive. But as more and more people and countries embrace it, it gets cheaper because there's more of a demand. But let's look at the parts of a wind turbine. We There are many, many parts that make up a wind turbine. So we could really go into depth here. But I'm just going to talk about five sections that I think are the most important. So we have first the rotor and all the rotor does is that it spins something called a generator. Remember I said I'd get back to a generator in a minute. Generator is what transforms that wind energy into electrical energy so we can use it. Really important, but the rotor is actually what helps spin that generator to make it move. So then we have the nacelle, which there's a close up of it on my picture. The nacelle is basically just this little body, the protective body that houses the really important parts of a wind turbine, like the hub, the brake, the um, shafts, the gearboxes, and the famous generator. <laughs> it's really important that that stuff is protected because that is where the um, energy is not created, because again, it's not being created, it's just being transformed from one form to another. Then we have the hub. All the hub does is that it spins the blades or allows those blades, those huge, huge blades to spin. If it wasn't for the hub, then wind would just blow through. It's like if you, I'm gonna pretend I'm holding a ruler. If I stood outside and just had this holding it and it was really windy. But if I connected it, I don't know, to a device that would help it spin, it would probably start to spin in the wind. So that hub is really important. Another part of a wind turbine is the yaw. All the yaw does is help the wind turbine turn. So it's kind of like a base that it sits on and helps it turn to the right or to the left because wind doesn't always come in one direction. And then we get to the generator, my favorite, because the generator is what converts the mechanical energy that's generated from the wind blowing through the blades and allows it to convert to electrical energy, which again, we need the electrical part so we can power all of our homes. So I always like to ask the question, and you don't have to answer because um, you can answer at the end too if you have any other thoughts on this. But I always like to ask, why do you think wind turbines are on a tower? Why do you think they're so huge? Because I bet we could get a lot more if they were really small and close to the ground. But they're really tall because it's really 
windy up high. The higher you get, the windier it is. And also, it's safer, especially if you have people walking by or animals. You don't want to get hit with those huge blades. So it's on the tower because it's the best way, the most efficient way to catch that wind. And another thing, I don't have it on my slideshow, but I would like to bring it up because I always thought, how is wind created? That's kind of a complicated thing to think about. Like, it just is, it just exists. But actually, wind is created through something called a convection current. And so it all comes from the sun, the heat from the sun. So the sun heats up our, the temperatures on Earth. Hot air rises. You've probably heard that before, especially if you're in the older grades. And cool air drops. I always like to think of it if I'm in a, in a house, it has an attic and a basement. On a hot day, if I go to the attic, it's really hot and stuffy. If I go down to the basement, it's really cool and kind of chilly down there. So it's just a good example if you um, have ever experienced that. Hot air rises, cool air drops, and that cycle creates wind. And that's how we get big bursts of wind. <laughs> Pretty neat to think about. Okay, so then another thing I always thought about is, okay, we have our wind turbine, but how is that actually getting to our homes? So I like this picture because it kind of gives a good visual. Again, my brain likes to see things to learn them rather than just being told. So this has four steps and it might be a little different in Canada, but the first step is wind turns the big blades of those turbines. That's that mechanical energy, that kinetic energy that's being transformed into electrical energy because of step number two. When those turbines spin, the generators create, I don't like the word create though, because you know how my thoughts, energy is not created, it's just transformed. So the mechanical energy is transformed to electrical energy because of those generators that are spinning because the turbines are spinning. And then it gets sent to something called a transformer. This is where I'm pretty sure you guys probably have them in Canada and maybe you call them something else, but a transformer it's kind of like a big, it's hard to describe. It's not a building, but it just looks like a bunch of metal um, contraptions piled on top of each other. And there's a lot of wires. Usually it's blocked off so people don't walk and touch anything because the transformer is where all the electrical energy goes and it help, um, the transformer actually increases or decreases the voltage. So then we can use it safely um, in our homes or schools or businesses. And then the last part, and you can probably look out your window right now and see an electrical line um, or a wire. And that electricity is coming from, through those lines from a transformer. So first step goes through the wind turbine, goes through the generators, then goes through a transformer, and then it gets brought to our homes through the wire, that you probably see on poles outside of your house or outside of your school. So it's a four step process, but again, it's kind of a good visual because my mind kind of stops off there. I'm like, okay, well then how does it get to us? That's exactly how it works. So before I move on, or before we get to the questions, I did wanna bring up other types of renewable energy because a lot of you guys are learning about conservation and wind energy is not the only option. So some places, maybe they don't get a lot of wind or maybe they just don't have the space for wind turbines. So there are other forms of energy. And the four I like to talk about are solar energy, geothermal energy, biomass, and hydroelectric energy. So the first one, solar, that's the easiest one. I brought it up before. You've probably seen solar panels. Um, those basically, again, they collect the energy from the sun, those photons, and then that energy is transformed into a electrical form of energy um, that goes right to our houses. I know sometimes cities have big areas. Maybe you've driven by them before and you've seen big areas fenced off with solar panels. 
um, in my own neighborhood, when I go for a walk, there's somebody that has a huge solar panel in their yard. And I've also seen it on top of roofs before too. So again, as it's getting more and more popular, more and more people can afford it and they can actually put it on their homes and have their own personal supply of solar energy. Or if you're a big city that has embraced solar energy, you distribute it to your um, citizens like you would with a wind turbine. You send it through the transformer and then it gets sent through those electrical lines. Geothermal is interesting. This picture, um, a geyser, it's that big shot of water that's shooting up. I've never been there, but it's called Old Faithful. That's just an example of an, uh, hot water or steam that's trapped underground. So it's really hot, really warm. You can actually gather that heat and that steam. And some people do harness it and transform it into, again, electrical energy so it can be used. Again, you're not burning anything, so it's a pretty clean source of energy. Another one, I will say you have to be responsible with this one biomass. So biomass is just using organic matter like crops, like corn or trees or animal waste, and it's burned. So it will create a little bit of pollution because you're burning something. And again, I say you have to be responsible with biomass or whoever is in charge of um, whatever, if your city's in charge of generating electricity through biomass, because for instance, if you cut down all the trees in your neighborhood to use as a source of energy, but then didn't plant those trees, then you'd be out of trees. It's a renewable energy source because you have seeds like for crops and you can replant, but if you're not diligent about doing it, if you're not responsible, then you will run out of that source. So if you take something away, you have to replace it or you have to replant it. Same with corn or crops, you have to be careful because you have to uh, pay attention to your soil. If you're, you have to rotate your crops or else it depletes the nutrients. And then you're also out of luck there because you can't use your soil in that particular area. So again, for biomass, it is considered renewable, but you have to be responsible with it. You have to replace what you take. And then hydroelectric, electric, which is very fascinating, is the use of dams or water to help generate electricity or transform electricity. So what happens is the water's falling over the dam and then it's captured and that water, that movement, that's kinetic energy, it's captured, it's transformed to mechanical energy through generators that water helps spin a generator, just like in our turbine or wind turbine. And then it gets transformed to electrical energy so we can use it. So all very great types of renewable energy sources. I just like to bring those up because wind energy is not the only one. There's a lot of forms out there. And then think about this for when you're typing in questions or comments at the end. Why is renewable energy important? Why, why should we even care about renewable energy? If we have coal and oil and it's cheap and it's fast, it's easy, why even care about renewable energy? So that's always something I like to think about. I'm not gonna tell you the answer right now, but we can discuss it at the very end because before I leave, I do want to, I'm gonna stop. really quickly, um, and Molly and Katie are going to share this with you if they haven't done so already, but I just want to show you how you guys can make a small wind turbine or a pinwheel at home. Again, usually when we do this with classes, I'll send out materials, but we can't do that for this purpose. So I've made one here. You've probably seen one of these before. It's called a pinwheel. You can call it a wind turbine too. But basically, it acts like a wind turbine. I'm the wind, the lungs from my, <laughs> or the wind from my lungs is coming out. I'm gonna blow it. You have to angle it specifically so it will actually turn. So 
you can kind of see how wind is captured by the blades of a rotor by modeling it and making your own uh, pinwheel. So all I have here is a pencil. I have a push pin, which is one of these little sharp things. You probably you probably have them at home. If not, you can always use um, maybe a paper clip, like the end of a paper clip, um, and then construction paper. So really quickly, what I did. I had con some construction paper. This was a rectangle originally. You might want to write down these directions, but again, you're going to have this link so you guys can do it at home. But I had a, p a rectangle, it was longer, and all I did was I measured the one side and I just made sure to make it a square that all the sides are equal length. So that's really important. You can use a ruler to help you. But you just want to make sure all four sides are the same length. Make a square. And then what you're going to do is you just fold it corner to corner like this. Oops. Oops. So I did that corner to corner. So you're going to have, when you open it, you're going to have four sections. It kind of looks like a kite. <laughs> so you have four seconds four sections, one, two, three, four. All right, so then once you've done that, uh, you will just mark, make a mark on your paper about a third of the way up through uh, your little cut that you made. So example, I did one here. So I drew a line, I'm trying to find a marker that's darker so you guys can see it. Imagine if you're a little tricky with fractions, if I said cut a third from the way from the center, just imagine these are three equal parts along this line and try your best. It doesn't have to be perfect. But I drew three lines before I cut, and that was my note to myself when I did cut it, not to cut all in the middle. It told me, okay, I need to stop at those lines. So then once you've stopped at those lines, all you do, and this is the tricky part, it can be a little frustrating, but if you have a flat surface um, and that push pin, it helps. You can also use some glue, like a glue stick or a glue gun to help you if it's just not working. But you're gonna take every other corner. So I'm gonna start with this corner. I'm gonna fold it to the center like that. And you're going to gather every other corner. So your thumb is going to have to stay right in the center. You're going to bring it down. Again, every other corner. Or get a parent or a sibling to help you. Yes, for sure. Because <laughs> again, this is when I'm not using a flat surface. So my corners are popping up. But once I have everything down, ta -da! although nope. I messed up my corners. There we go. Then once you have all four corners down like that, that's when you can push it with your push pin. So and just make sure, especially if you're younger, just try not to poke your finger. So that can be a little painful. And you might have corners that pop out again. It's trial and error. It's what science is sometimes. You just got to stick with it. Be patient modify it that's what i always like to say with my other wind turbine that i show kids is it can be a little frustrating so you just have to take your time be patient with yourself you'll get it eventually but my push pin is through oh the center of my paper i have my pencil and i'm going to stick it through the pointy end i'm going to stick it through my eraser Ooh. And there you go. See, again, frustrating because my corner popped up, but you get the idea. You just want to make sure you're sticking your pointy part through all four corners. And there's your pinwheel. <laughs> so again, flat surface, adult help. It's really simple, though, because it's just paper, pencil, push pin, and scissors. And again, you're going to have that link. It helps me. Again, I'm a visual learner. It helps me to see the step by step. So that's how I made that one originally, my red one. And you can get fun with it. You can make it white. You can make it different colors. Have fun with it, especially since we're stuck inside.
and then again blow on it and just experiment. Okay, that's how a wind turbine moves. That's how it creates that mechanical energy. So do you guys have any questions for me before I go? It was fun to share all that knowledge. I like asking or hearing questions too. Uh, we're just waiting, but I would like to share. Mm -hmm. um, I would like, there's something that I just wanted to share when you were talking about the geysers and um, how powerful they are. So a few years ago, I was in, oh, how does it, I, I'm just going to finish the story. I was in Iceland and saw a geyser that, that blows every, um, every, minute and 30 seconds so i found a video that i want to show the students because it yeah. is really cool but jibbler would like to know how does a generator work Ooh, so a generator works i'm not gonna act like i know the exact science of it because it's very specific and i don't want to give you the wrong info but i'll tell you what i know is that for a wind turbine when those rotors are turning inside of a generator it has some mechanisms or like you can think of them as wheels that once one thing is turning and it makes another thing start to turn so then when the generator is turning it's generate it's transforming one form of energy into another because of the moving parts inside of the generator again I would have to research it more. I don't want to give you the wrong information. You can totally research that um, up as well. That's a really great question. And I actually have to learn a little bit more about exactly, because I just have a very simple understanding of it. But good question, Jibbler. You guys want to see the geyser? And then I will show you how um, where to find how to make the wind turbine. It's a little bit more complicated than the pinwheel. I will add a pinwheel today. Um, do you guys want to see the geyser? So cool. Yeah, Greenland's, or you said Iceland? Iceland's a big okay. geothermal. Yeah, it's a big geothermal. So a lot of the heat is coming from up. It's uh, Iceland is a, in, a, a volcanic island. Everything around it is volcanoes. It, it is made from a volcano. So there's a lot of hot water and a lot of energy being pushed up that we're gonna learn about next week in volcanoes because we have two volcano sessions next week that you guys added for, so asked for. So we'll learn about geothermic energy, but I just wanna share this with you because it's a really, really cool video. And I was looking for my own one, my own video, but it, I couldn't find it in my pictures, but this is the same place that I went. So I'm going to start it and you can let me know if you can. Can you see my screen, Rebecca? Yep. Okay, maybe Katie can yep. pin it so that the kids can see. And just watch the geyser. <laughs> So you can see that big blue hole is where it comes, the energy comes from. You can see the heat. Can I see it again? I'm just going to turn it back to that little spot. So that's what a geothermic geyser looks like. Pretty awesome. So cool. Yeah. So cool. Volcano, volcanic activity is a big, um, that's what heats that water and creates that steam underground. So it's great that you guys will be learning about volcanoes too. Yeah. And here I'm going to show you on our Connected North at Home. I'm just going to move this over. Connected North at Home website. You go to additional resources and we are going to let it load and scroll down and 
We use the picture of a tarantula for Ann Arbor because Lana showed us one. Oh, yeah. Source page. And we have all the activities that Rebecca sent to me. So where is the one how to make a windmill? Right here. And we can go here and it says how to make a windmill. So if you read the instructions, you'll be able to see how to make the windmill. There is a picture here somewhere in the gallery. So it shows you how to make a windmill. Those are the steps that you can use. So you print out the windmill worksheets right here, just download it and it will give you a piece of paper to make the windmill and that's how you do it. And that one's fun because you can actually think engineering concepts behind it as well. The the pinwheel one we need um, was very simple, but with the other windmill website, you can actually think about okay, how can I how can I take this further? So it's a good website for you guys. And then I think there was I thought I put something else here. Um, there was another one on a turbine, but I will find that one. So thing that has been sent from um, Lannis and Rebecca is on that website. So we hope you guys can uh, can um, make one. And Jibbler asked, what is inside the geyser hole? Um, the big blue piece, the blue piece that was in there. Well, that is um, that is water that is so pure it's such pure water that there is no color in it so that doesn't make sense does it it really doesn't make sense because it looks like a beautiful blue and i actually i'm not even going to go there i can go find a piece of a rock that's that color but um the, there is no the water is so pure there's no color and that's why it's that color of blue because it's it's reflecting all of the other colors from around it. And if you look at sea ice, it's the same thing. The ice is so compact and so pure. Um, there's no oxygen in it, like there's no oxygen in it. There's just, it's just such a pure thing that there's no color. Then it turns out to be that it's called an Azra blue. And I guess that's about the best explanation. It's the most pure thing, the most pure color that you can get. Yeah. And, and that's, it's really, really hot too, that in the geyser hole. Like yeah. you can and it's it. really, really, really hot. Um, so there's a there's reasons for the water being that color. It's just the pureness of it all. And that's an actually a, a question for Lori, the astrophysicist who talked about light. Yeah, so thanks. <laughs> well, so we'll pin you again, Rebecca, because you're the important one. Well, thank you so much. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm the important one. Well, yeah, well, it's so wonderful to talk to you guys um, in your homes. I'm so glad you guys attended. Again, I like to think I'm an expert, but there are things I learn every day. So I always try to read up um, on the topics every chance I can get whether it be through the internet or through resources that are provided by my teachers, really, really helpful um, to do that every chance you can get. But again, think of that last question I had as you live your life, as you grow up, why is renewable energy important? Like wind energy. So I personally think it's important because it's less pollution and it's better for the environment. You may have your own ideas too. So thank you guys so much. I had such a fun time and I hope you had a great time too. <laughs> we always love connecting with you. So maybe in June, we'll do a slime session. I think yeah. we did that. It was yeah. awesome, Rebecca, thank you. Thank you. And even if the slime is just me making it, the kids can at least watch. You know, I know that's what a lot of the kids have been doing, so. <laughs> For sure. And right. we'll, we'll provide the recipe. Oh, awesome. Okay.
Okay, thanks, Rebecca. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.